Will Robinson here from Robinson's Auto, toolsandtime.com. Today I'm going to give you a rundown of the basic operation, common failures, and some repair tips of the automotive cooling system. So why do we need the cooling system? Well, the internal combustion engine generates heat during a process known as combustion and friction. Combustion events are controlled by the timing of the engine. The amount of times they occur are directly related to the engine's RPM. Friction for moving internal parts is being mostly cooled and displaced by the engine's oil. This process will generate heat as well. While these events are generating the energy we have all come to love, you know, when the rubber meets the road, not all that energy is being used. We are left with a tremendous amount of heat. So how do we utilize and control this leftover energy? The cooling system, while seeming pretty basic, plays a huge role in the engine's efficiency, not to mention the engine's lifespan. Okay, let's go over some of the main players in the coolant system. We'll start with antifreeze. It's used to dissipate heat in the coolant system through conduction. While most engines have an optimal operating temperature near or above 200 degrees Fahrenheit or around 93 degrees Celsius, a substance with a high boiling point needs to be used. In addition, when temperatures fall below freezing, we need a substance with a low freezing point. That's where ethylene glycol comes into play. When mixed 50-50 with water, both these variables are achieved, along with pressure, which we will cover later. The radiator, made up of materials with good thermal conductivity values. A good example would be copper or aluminum. Its job is to transfer heat via convection. As coolant passes through the engine, it will absorb heat. When hot coolant circulates through the radiator tubes, the coolant transfers the heat to the tubes. The tubes further transfer that heat to the fins surrounding the tubes. These fins greatly increase the surface area. The heat is then released to ambient air. The heater core, pretty much a small radiator with similar functions, usually located behind a dash in a heater box. Its main job is to supply the cabin of the vehicle with heat. The water pump, a mechanical pump that circulates the coolant that absorbs the heat. Most water pumps are driven by either the engine's accessory belt or the timing belt. The thermostat, a temperature sensitive orifice used to regulate the flow of coolant between a radiator and engine. Example, if you have a thermostat rated for 195 degrees Fahrenheit, when the engine is cold the thermostat will remain closed, not allowing the coolant to pass through the radiator to be cooled. Once temperature is achieved, the thermostat will begin to open, allowing fluid to pass. The coolant fan. Used to pull air through the radiator, displacing radiant heat in exchange for cooler ambient air, mainly at lower speeds or idling, to help maintain operating temperature. Coolant fans can be either mechanical belt driven, like the lower upper right thumbnail, or electrical, as seen below. Hoses, used to connect various components in the coolant system. The pressure cap, one of the main players in the coolant system, as simple as it may look. Pressure caps come in various pressure ratings. They claim for every 1 PSI, the boiling point is increased 3 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that's pretty cool. Not only does the radiator cap increase the boiling point, if the pressure rises above its rating, it acts as a pressure relief valve allowing the expanded coolant to be expelled into an expansion tank. This thing keeps getting better and better. There's more to this nifty device. When the coolant cools and contracts, the pressure differential opens another valve in the cap, allowing coolant to re-enter the coolant system. Man, I need to add another slide for this one. Let's take a look. If you take notice, there's two sealing points in the radiator neck. The upper ledge, near the notches, that's where seal number one keeps the coolant from spraying all over during operation. This seal will remain closed at all times. If you look deeper into the radiator neck near the coolant level, you will see another ledge. This is where seal number two keeps the fluid from entering the expansion tank under a preset spring pressure. Now if you look at that metal device number three on the radiator cap, this is a vacuum valve. This allows coolant to re-enter the system from the expansion tank. 
I will put all these items together and try to give you a better explanation. Let's cover some of the basic operations. When the engine is cold, coolant will circulate through the coolant passages in the engine and back through a bypass hose. In most cases, the heater core is part of the bypass loop. The thermostat will remain closed with spring pressure keeping the radiator out of the coolant circulation loop. As the engine coolant temperature rises to a preset temperature of the thermostat, the thermostat will begin to open, allowing the coolant to pass through the radiator in exchange for colder coolant. This process will continue until all coolant reaches its optimal operating temperature near 200 degrees Fahrenheit. At this point, the coolant fans engage, allowing the hot radiant heat from the radiator to be displaced and cooler ambient air to pass through, furthering the cooling process of the radiator. This is most important at lower speeds or idling due to low airflow. As the coolant temperature rises, the coolant expands. This will cause the pressure to rise in the coolant system. As the pressure rises above atmospheric, it will lift the boiling point of the coolant. As the pressure continues to rise above the pressure cap's preset pressure, a spring-loaded valve will open allowing coolant to enter an expansion tank, also known as an overflow canister, via an overflow tube. As the engine temperature drops, coolant will contract and the pressure will drop below atmospheric in the coolant system, creating a vacuum effect. This pressure differential will open another valve in the pressure cap that allows the coolant to re-enter the system from the expansion tank. When things go wrong. When components in the system fail to operate correctly, there will be an adverse reaction. Here are some of the common symptoms and repair tips. Words of caution. Never open a radiator cap under pressure. Wait until the engine cools. Coolant leak, lack of coolant. Here's a repair tip. Check the coolant level. If low, perform a pressure test on the coolant system. Don't exceed the maximum PSI limit. Refer to the rating on the radiator pressure cap. That will be a good indicator. If not, refer to your owner's manual or repair service manual. Check for external coolant leaks in addition to internal coolant leaks. Milky colored oil is one sign of an internal leak. Excessive white smoke emitting from the tailpipe while the engine is running is another sure sign of an internal coolant leak. If a leak is found, perform the necessary repairs. Double check repairs by reperforming a pressure test. If all seems well, top off with coolant and monitor. A faulty pressure cap, most commonly overlooked, allowing coolant to exit the system and not return. Repair tip, inspect the pressure cap, replace if even questionable, top off the system and monitor. If the pressure in the coolant system is high due to a mechanical problem, proceed with your troubleshooting. A stuck closed thermostat, not allowing the coolant to pass through the radiator. A common sign would be a superheated upper hose with a noticeable cool lower hose. If ran too long, the radiant heat will expand, the coolant overpressurizing the coolant system above the pressure cap's limit and expelling coolant into the expansion tank. Repair tip, drain coolant, inspect and replace thermostat, top off with coolant, and monitor. Restrictions in the coolant system will have a similar effect as a stuck closed thermostat due to the lack of flow. Depending on the restriction, in most cases it's a more gradual overheat. Most restrictions are found in the radiator due to the smaller passages. A good troubleshooting technique tool that I use is an infrared temperature gun. While the engine is hot, scan the radiator with the temp gun and look for noticeable cooler spots. This will indicate a restriction. Repair tip. Flush the coolant system. If conditions don't improve, replace the radiator. A faulty water pump. Lack of coolant flow. Check the dry belt and check for any play in the water pump. When possible, remove the belt and feel for any rubbing or abnormalities. Replace if needed. Also do a good inspection. If the belt seems war, cracked, like in the picture below, replace it. Also take a look at that faulty water pump. These are things to take note. Air in the system. An airbound system will act similar as well, 
In some cases, a more rapid temp increase will be noticed. This is most commonly an issue with systems where the radiator sits lower than the highest coolant component. Repair tip. If you suspect a coolant system has been opened due to repairs or had a loss of coolant for any reason, try bleeding, burping the system. Most times you will find a bleeder near the highest point in the system. I will put a link in the description to a video I performed a water pump replacement on that required bleeding. Airflow. Lack of airflow due to coolant fans not operating correctly or something restricting the airflow across the radiator. If you find the vehicle overheats during slow speeds or idle, then cools off while driving at higher speeds, it's a good indication of a coolant fan not operating correctly. This is more commonly noticed on vehicles equipped with electrical coolant fans due to the lack of any movement when not engaged. However, this can still apply with mechanical fans as well. In addition, check for anything that may cause restriction of airflow across the radiator. I have found bags, leaves, paper, radiators, or condensers totally blinded with dirt. Repair tip. Observe the coolant fans. Most electrical coolant fans are commanded on around 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If the coolant temp continues to climb and the fan remains off, you will need to perform further troubleshooting of the coolant fan circuit. Turn on the AC. The fan should turn on shortly after. If you don't have AC or the AC is inoperative, this won't work. If you have a bi-directional scanner, command the coolant fans on. If the fan turns on during any of these two tests, we know we have power, the relay is working correctly, and the fan motor is good. At this point, if the vehicle is equipped with a designated fan temp sensor, I would direct my attention there while using a wiring schematic testing my way through the circuit. If the coolant fan fails to operate with any commands, check the basics first. Check the coolant fan fuse. The fan relay. Unplug the fan. Spin the fan by hand, feeling for any bind in or play. Perform a continuity check on the fan. Check the fan motor for opens or short at windings. Step your way through the circuit using a wiring schematic. For further guidance, check out my video on troubleshooting using wiring schematics. I'll post a link in the description. On vehicles equipped with mechanical coolant fans, here's two basic styles, thermal and non-thermal, aka torque limited. Thermal clutch fans use a temperature sensitive coil. Observe the speed of the fan from a cold start. As the engine reaches operating temperature, you should see a noticeable difference in the speed of the fan. Slow when cold, fast when hot. Now non-thermal stay engaged and tend to spin 30 to 60 percent of the water pump speed. With the engine off on both thermal or non-thermal, check for excessive play or binding as this will be a sure sign of failure. Replace if needed or questionable. If you check out these two clutch fans, you'll notice the one on the left has a spring and the one on the right don't. Well that's a basic sign that the one on the left is thermal controlled. That's a thermal spring and the one on the right is a torque limiting non-thermal. That's one indication. If any obstruction is found that is affecting airflow, remove it. If the radiator or condenser seems blinded, try flushing it with a water hose. It can make a huge difference. A combustion leak. Allowing exhaust gases to enter the coolant system. There are a couple ways to check for this. One indication is the presence of bubbles in the coolant system. Monitor the pressure with the radiator pressure tester. From a cold start, a quick climb in pressure at idle or snap of the throttle is one indication. Keep in mind this is not the same as coolant expansion, so don't let the two get confused. A noticeable combustion leak will have a much greater rate of rise. Commonly, a more preferred method uses a combustion leak detector. This setup will sample the air in the coolant system. The air will be passed through a blue fluid. If the fluid turns yellow or greenish, it has detected combustion gases in the coolant system. I have personally seen this test cause confusion. This fluid can be very sensitive. A sample of your breath can cause the color to change. So keep this in mind. While performing the test, a nearby exhaust leak can cause a bad reading. Keep a tight seal while testing. Well, that's enough with the overheating for now. What about an engine that's running cold? 
While this could be caused by a few things, I will cover just a couple basic causes and tips since this tutorial is getting quite lengthy. I'm sure I got a few heads nodding by now. Extended heat up time. One cause can be a faulty clutch fan. If you notice the fan spinning at the same RPM as the engine while the engine is cold, this will extend the heat up cycle. Inspect or replace if needed. However, the most common cause for extended heat up is a stuck open thermostat, allowing coolant to circulate through the radiator without the proper retention time in the engine. This can drastically affect the heat up cycle, and in some cases, especially at low ambient temperatures, the engine may never reach its optimal temp, greatly affecting the engine's efficiency. Thank you for your time, guys. That's enough for now. Let's get back to the shop and fix something. One last tech tip. If your vehicle is overheating, try turning on the heater full blast. Open the windows if needed. The heater core acts as a small radiator and in some cases will get you to a more preferred location to repair or have the vehicle repaired. If this don't help, don't push your luck. Stop. Running an engine hot can cause severe damage. I hope that helped you gain a better understanding of the cooling system and some of the symptoms you may come across. While I just covered some of the basic ones that occurred in my time in the field, those are some of the most common solutions as well. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Stay tuned. Please subscribe to see more.